trophy. Three times around a three-mile track at a minimum 95 miles an hour. Rack up three laps at that speed, and you can race the world's fastest water scooters for cash and the trophy. Johnny Cleaver won his chance with the best three-lap average of the year, 107 miles per hour. Now, the day before the race, he was unwinding a little with his fiancée, Jill Bromley. And guess who was chaperoning the party? I'm gonna get wet, Commodore. He isn't a Commodore, is he? Sure he is, with the Coast Guard Auxiliary. Watch, tomorrow he'll be out there with a the whole flotilla. Really, Mike? Doing what? Oh, helping the Coast Guard keep the course clear. Holding back the spectators, things like that. You see, you don't have to worry about me winning, honey. Mike won't let the people mob me. Now, you wait for me down below now. He's so conceited. He's got a good chance to win that boat race tomorrow. Well, he's got to simmer down. He's wound up all right. But compared to that brother of his, I swear, Mike, Fred wants Johnny to win so badly his teeth ache. Well, you better go ahead, huh? Your boyfriend will be wondering what's happening to you up here. Nothing, darn it. <laughs> At the bottom of the bay, Jill looked around for her fiancé, Johnny. They were wonderful kids, both of them, bursting with energy and high spirits, especially Johnny, because of the strain he'd been under for so many months. They were expert divers. No matter how much they fooled around, I was pretty sure they wouldn't do anything really foolish. WM-2050, Mike Nelson. WM-2050, Mike Nelson. This is Fred Cleaver. Over. That is WM-2050. Mike Nelson. Over. Trouble, Mike. I've got to get together with Johnny. He's still out there with you? Yeah, he's in the water. What's the matter, the boat? You bet it's a boat. Tell him to get in so he can lend a hand with it. Or we can forget racing tomorrow and watch TV. Okay, Fred. How soon you need him? Like an hour ago. I'll be waiting at the yard. Out. Oh. Uh, tough break for Johnny. I wondered if his brother Fred realized how tough. Today was Johnny's last chance to rest up before tomorrow's rocket ride. Now he'd have to work the rest of the day. Most of the night, too, maybe. Fixing the boat. Mighty big handicap to give a driver and expect him to come through in front. Alive. On my way down, I kept trying to figure it out. If Fred was so anxious to have Johnny win tomorrow, how come he hadn't called in some expert mechanics to fix whatever was wrong with their boat? Why did it have to be Johnny, who needed every bit of rest and relaxation he could possibly get? It was all well and good for Fred to keep going till he dropped, to make sure their boat was in perfect shape. But if Johnny did the same thing, he wouldn't last out the first heat. Well, that had to be their problem, though. Mine was to find Johnny and get Fred's message to him. Johnny and Jill spotted me first. When 
I caught sight of them, they were off and running. Catching up with them figured to be tough. They had a mighty healthy lead to start with. They lengthened their lead so far, I just about lost sight of them. Still, I had to get the word to Johnny pretty soon, or all the work that he and Fred had done so far might add up to zero tomorrow. Moray. Six feet of steel elastic, topped by a head full of teeth too sharp to believe, until you feel them. I was sure that Johnny and Jill had too much sense to be hiding anywhere in this area. But where were they? I spotted some bubbles. A few moments later, I saw Jill. No sign of Johnny, though. Maybe he'd gone topside. No, he'd just been hiding around the corner. He rushed me and I fastened my weight belt almost before I knew it. Up I went in spite of myself. But I couldn't waste any more time trying to deliver Fred's message, so I dropped it. The slate read, Fred needs you at Boatyard, urgent. They got the message fast. You think sure I got the bugs out by now? You haven't been idle, that's for sure. Lower spread, intercooler, intake valve? Both intake valves, both exhaust valves, both magnetos. Check them all, John boy. What's doing it? Gremlins? You tell me. Something so small, probably. We'll flip when you find it. Take me five minutes to fix. When he finds it, I remember you're the crew chief. No, just a fair country handyman, that's all. Hey, we go in the first heat tomorrow, 12 noon. Let's get cracking. We'll make it. Great day off while it lasted, huh, Mike? Thanks again. Ah, uh, my pleasure. We'll do it again soon. Now, it's gonna be a rough day for you tomorrow, even on a full night's sleep, so, uh, you get as much as you can, you hear? Look, I assure he's still the best driver going. And I bet on him to win blindfolded. And I agree. Come on, lover. Take care. Come on, let's get going. <laughs> trouble was minor, a defective gasket deep inside the intake system. But it took Johnny till four in the morning to find it. And just four hours later at eight, he was checking out Miss Tewry on the official oval. There was no time for a thorough test. The course closed at 9 a.m. Then the race officials and the Coast Guard took over. The Coast Guard's job was maintaining safety on the course. Ours, as members of the auxiliary, was to police the surrounding waters. Unless spectator craft stayed where they were told, boats and lives could be lost, their own included. As flotilla commander, I assigned each of my boats to a specific post. Then I headed out to my own, at the far end of the bay. I had warned Jill that she wouldn't be able to see much of the race from here, except on TV, but she insisted on coming along anyway. Hey, wanna take a look? Thanks, but what I can't see won't scare me. You're that worried, huh? Ah, uh, he's a fine driver, the best. I'm four hours sleep. Wait 
minute before the first heat. Go ahead, Mike. Turn it on. No reason for you not to see it. No reason for me either. And coming up to the starting line for heat number one in this year's rooster tail run from the outside in, it's Ron Stevens in Shandy Gaff, Bill Dord in Cyclone 2, Johnny Cleaver in Miss T. Reed, Sid Burns in Goodbye Charlie, and Ben Kenoy in Hurry Gal. Can't tell who's going to get away first. They're bunched so tight. Cyclone 2, maybe. No, it's Goodbye Charlie. Then Cyclone 2, Hurry Gal, Miss T. Reed, and Shandy Gaff. Cyclone 2 has a bone in her teeth, and she's running with it. She seems to have it all her way, and now, no, no, Miss T. Ree slashed ahead through the spray, and she's in the lead now. Cyclone 2 is pressing her hard, though, followed by Goodbye Charlie and Hurry Gal. They hold those positions going into the back stretch. Still anybody's race. Now, Shandy Gap is moving up into contention. Yes, Ron Stevens is really pushing Shandy Gap hard now. Apparently, he doesn't like it because he's moving up on the outside now. Yes, looks like the first sprint of the day. Johnny Cleaver in Miss T. Reed, veering to the outside as he tears through the 1,000 yards straight away toward the south turn. Just what he did the other day in his record-breaking 107-mile-an-hour qualifying heat. He's going to hit that turn all out. He's sweeping wide, very wide, maybe too wide. Don't see how he can clear the patrol boat. Can't tell for sure, too much spray, but the others are knifing past with goodbye Charlie leading, followed by Shandy Gap. Red flag, red flag, they're stopping the race. Do you think it could be Johnny? An accident. There go the rockets, two red rockets, telling all the hydros to get off the course. We still don't know why or what boats are involved, perhaps some spectator craft. Our TV cameras have just picked up the rescue helicopter that the Coast Guard always maintains for such emergencies. We'll follow it to the accident scene if we possibly can. There it is. There, the 40-foot Coast Guard patrol boat that was on duty at the south turn, as you can see. It was hit hard, very hard, and it's sinking. And there's the boat that hit her, Johnny Cleaver's Miss T. Ree. He swept into that turn even wider than we thought. No sign of Johnny. He must have been hurled out when he hit. As far as we know, the patrol boat crew all got off safely. We're checking that. And just as soon as we... Hold it, hold it. There's a man coming out now through the gaping hole, a crewman. That's Ron Stevens of Shandy Gap diving in to see what he can do to help anyone else in the water. There's someone down there. We can't make out who. There goes the frogman from the helicopter to team up with Stevens. And down comes the rescue basket. They're putting someone in it. It could be Johnny Cleaver. We don't know. Do you think he's all right? I'm sure he is. up a cyclone of dust. They've brought the crewman out and they put him in an ambulance. Now a second man's getting out. We're not sure, but he looks like... Yes, it's Johnny Cleaver. Well, friends, that's good news. Oh, he's all right. 
Hey, hey, watch out, watch out. Kill. You're gonna get us killed in a minute. Stop it. Stop it. It's wonderful. I wonder how it happened. I didn't think he was that tired. Oh, neither did I. I don't know what happened. I went into the turn the exact same way I did in the qualifying heat. Then, bam, that was it. End of the line. Johnny, it's got to be more than that. Well, look, let's face it. The kid was dead tired. I wasn't that tired. I didn't goof. I'm not saying you did, John Boy. But if you made a mistake, you did. I didn't. Johnny. The reports say that once you started swinging wide, you didn't try very hard to get back on course. Is that what you think, Mike? You tell me differently? If those reports stand, you've had it. You'll never race a hydroplane again. Johnny, was there anything wrong with the boat? I've said it all. Fred, let's go, huh? Sure, John Boy. Sure. Do you think it was Johnny's fault? No, it's hard to believe. He's too good a driver. Didn't the, didn't the Coast Guard find anything wrong with the boat? Nope. Not the parts they examined. The parts they didn't examine might tell a different story. I think I'll go down there and see for myself right now. Oh, thanks, Mike. I, I'll never be able to thank you. Neither would Johnny. If I can find something to clear him. Oh, I know you will. And thanks. I wasn't able to start my search on the water as soon as I'd planned. The area was preempted by the Coast Guard to haul up the patrol boat that Johnny had rammed and sunk. I still didn't know if it had been his fault, but it sure looked that way. I didn't get clearance to dive till late in the afternoon. When I did get downstairs, I saw that I had my work cut out for me. Miss Tiri had been doing close to 100 miles an hour when it hit that iron-hulled patrol boat. No wonder the debris was scattered far and wide. Finding any kind of a definite clue wasn't going to be quick or easy. The fact is, I didn't have any clear idea what I was looking for. I picked up whatever seemed to be worth further examination. I didn't think that I was making any particular headway. But somebody down there didn't agree with me. Another diver. He seemed to think that I'd found something very important. And he wanted it. And it was up to me to convince him that he couldn't have it. Driver was Johnny Cleaver. What's the big idea, Johnny? Forget it. Why'd you try to hijack me? It's my business. Why, Johnny? Why? Now, maybe Jill knows, huh? Our friend. Johnny! Johnny, Jill! Here we 
was Johnny. Mike, you're kidding. Johnny wouldn't do a thing like that. He did, Jill. You told him I was going out there, didn't you? Yes. Why didn't you tell him why? Well, he, he knew that you were just trying to help him. I didn't ask him to. You still don't want to say why you tried to hijack me, huh? Sorry. Well, that accident was either your fault or your brother's. Now, you think that uh, Fred pulled some kind of a boner with that boat? You trying to protect him? Hey, what are you talking about? He checked her out himself this morning. The boat was perfect. John Boy wasn't trying to protect me. Then you're protecting yourself, huh? Well, I'm going back out there tomorrow morning. You better come up with an answer before I do. This trip down, I found something right away. Trouble. This diver, whoever he was, knew exactly what he was searching for. It seemed that he'd spotted it. What's more, he was all set to take it away. Not if I could help it, though. Not before I found out what it was myself. It was the rudder post, the rod that the rudder swings on. And one glance told me that it had been sabotaged. It added up just one way. Johnny Cleaver had tried to kill me, to keep me from exposing his brother's sabotage. But in that case, who was the diver who had rescued me? Whoever he was, he needed help. I gave it to him as fast as I could. The three of us started for the service together. My head was throbbing from the wallop I'd taken and buzzing with questions. The answers gave me a real headache. It was Fred Cleaver who tried to kill me. He had sabotaged the boat to kill Johnny. Johnny had tried to cover up for him once. This time, though, he'd had to help me nail his brother for Fred's own good. If I gotta go to jail, okay. I got it coming. Well, I was out of my head, sure, but... But that's no excuse. Where is it? I'm not a judge, Fred. Or a doctor. Yeah. Yeah, maybe that's what I need. A doctor. You'll have the best, Fred, I promise you. How do you figure it? I jobbed that rudder to kill you. You didn't mean it, Fred. You couldn't. You still don't get it. I've been hating you ever since you were born. Over 20 years, boy. Why? Because you were the baby. Because you got everything, because... Mom didn't even know I was alive. So I wanted you dead. Didn't you know that? No. Do you still feel the same way, Fred? I don't know. To tell you the truth, I don't feel anything now. Come on, Fred. Let's go tell the Coast Guard, huh? See you, Johnny. See you, friend boy. Hi. I'm Lloyd Bridges, inviting you to join us for another action-packed story of underwater adventure one week from today.
at 6 a.m. on the morning of July 17th, the freighter, Arundel, caught in a gale of near hurricane intensity, went aground on Morisco Shoals. Her master, Tom Nicholson, put out a distress call immediately. The news was flashed to the general public by radio and television. When I heard it, I rushed to Tom Nicholson's home. Tom had been my skipper in Korea. He and his daughter, Peg, were good friends of mine. Mike. Right, Peg. Mike, thanks so much for coming. Oh, sure, sure. At 11.27, Tom Nicholson gave the order to abandon ship. The entire crew took to the lifeboats. But Tom Nicholson stayed aboard, true to the traditions of the sea. By now, the freighter Felix was on her way to the Arundel. The whole world awaited news of her arrival. We interrupt this program to bring you a bulletin just received from the Coast Guard. Captain Moss of the freighter Felix reports that he found the Arundel totally abandoned when he reached Morisco Shoals a few moments ago. The Arundel skipper, Tom Nicholson, was not on board, apparently a casualty of the storm. The Felix is now proceeding for port with the Arundel in tow. We return you to Musical Medley. The morning that the Arundel arrived in port, the lawyers for the Felix filed a salvage claim against her as an abandoned vessel. Since Tom Nicholson had been the Arundel's owner as well as her skipper, Peg decided to fight the claim. She asked me to get her the smartest admiralty lawyer in town. So I did. Todd Webster. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Webster. I just don't understand. I'm sorry, too. But I don't take cases I can't win. What makes you think you can't win this one? The Arundel was abandoned. Captain Moss said so under oath. I don't buy that. Tom Nicholson wouldn't abandon his ship. Oh? What did he do? We were hoping you'd be able to find out, Mr. Webster, and clear his name. Have you any idea how rough that might be on you? I don't care. You do know what Captain Moss said in his affidavit, don't you? Yes, but I'm yes, sure Yes, we'll that... do, thank you. And if the court finds that, in fact, the Arundel was abandoned, do you know that he's entitled to as much as a third of her value as Salvor? Do you know that? Of course I do. So, if the court approves the salvage claim, you may have to pay Moss as much as a million dollars. That's more than your equity in the vessel, so you'll lose it. I don't care about that. My father did not abandon his ship. You know that to be a fact? I know my father. He was a brave man. He was decorated three times in Korea. Do you also know for a fact that he wasn't swept overboard? He rode out worse storms than that dozens of times. And you know for a fact that he wasn't the victim of an accident or a mistaken judgment? Well, no. Isn't it possible, then, that he wasn't on board when Moss reached the shoals? Anything's possible, but in this case... In I... this case, you have no basis in fact, do you, for disputing Captain Moss's claim, do you? Well, I don't have any proof, Thank but... you, Miss Nicholson. That will be all. What do you mean, Mr. Webster? That isn't all. No. No, I, I could have hit you much harder. Moss's attorney would lots harder. I hope you won't ever give him the chance to in court. You mustn't, Miss Nicholson. You don't have a case. Wait a minute, Mr. Webster. She doesn't, Mr. Nelson. Let me ask you a question or two now. All right. Suppose that Tom Nicholson didn't abandon his ship and that he wasn't swept overboard either. I mean, just supposing. All right. What could have happened to him then? Well, I, uh, I suppose he could have been removed from his ship. You mean murder, don't you? By Moss? It's possible. If he brought the Arundel in with Tom aboard, what would he collect? A towage fee. But without Tom or anyone else aboard, well, you said it yourself. He'd get a third of the ship. And I'd say it's very possible. Is it? What makes you think Moss would commit murder for that? What makes you think he wouldn't? I don't know a thing about Moss, do you? I do, Mr. W. Buddy of mine shipped in the Felix one time. That's all he could take. Well, Moss starves his crew darn near. Lives pretty high in the hog himself, though. Champagne, caviar. On shore, too? Well, he's the last of the big-time spenders. But on what? My buddy says Moss doesn't rate that kind of loot. Well, how about that now, huh? You don't win in court on hearsay. 
You need evidence. Miss Nicholson, forgive me. But if this is murder, we don't even have a body to prove it. What if I could find the body? <laughs> In those shoals? Well, I admit it won't be easy. Yeah. Yeah. You'd have a good chance. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, I mean it. Look, I've done a little diving myself, and you've got a pretty fair record. Now, that's not just my opinion. It could be Moss's, too. What do you mean, Mr. Webster? Todd, I, I may be working for you. I will be, if Moss goes for this story. Good morning, Captain Moss. Morning, Counselor. Have you seen this yet? Search for Nicholson body. Diver, lawyer to search shoals for missing skipper. Well, this is just splendid, splendid. Now, how do you figure that? Well, if they do find the body, and Nelson's quite capable of doing so, it'll prove our case beyond the shadow of a doubt. Prima facie evidence of exactly how Nicholson lost his life. Sunshine or storm, no day's a good day for dying. Heading out of harbor at dawn didn't make me nervous about what we might run into at Morisco Shoals. Just angry. I poured on the coal all the way out, steaming inside over what I was sure now had happened to Tom Nicholson. Todd Webster was too much of a lawyer to buy my theory completely, but I didn't mind that. As a matter of fact, I admired his caution. He was turning out to be a mighty good man to have on the team. See anything? No, not a boat in sight. Maybe he figured out the odds and decided not to worry, huh? Maybe he doesn't have anything to worry about. Oh, no. He killed Tom Nicholson. I feel pretty sure about that, Todd. He knows if we found the body, an autopsy could kill him. Well, let's get wet then, just in case. Hey, they won't see that thing, will they, if they do come after us? Not before it sees them. That thing was a periscope marine camera with a telephoto lens, designed to spy out topside activity without being spied on. For the past 20 minutes, though, there'd been nothing to spy. Hold it. Good job on my boat. Yeah, sorry. But did you get a picture? Yeah, whole oh, set of it. All we have to do now is to get ashore with them. Here, yeah, hold this, will you? Yeah. Well, what's that? A radio buoy. Sends out a mayday. Gives the Coast Guard a fix in opposition. 
And boy, we're a long way from home. We were too far from land even to attempt to swim. On top of that, the currents were against us. So we waited interminable hours for rescue, hoping against hope that our distress signal had been heard, that help was on the way. Tired? Well, I can't imagine why. We've been on our backs all day. Hey, how are the pictures? Great, just great. Here they are. For identification purposes, that is. Yeah, look at them. I dropped off a set at the FBI. John Ferrillo's on it. He's hoping for a make on the passenger through the bomb files. Anything you want me to tell him? No, not yet. You, Mike? Yeah. Ask him to buzz the FAA and find out who owns helicopter number N6720D. What is this for? I've never carried a gun in my life. All right, mate, it's turn around. And I've never been arrested either. Is that why Moss hired you? Moss? Is that the guy I took out there? You know his name wasn't Moss. What was it? He didn't tell me. Why didn't you ask him? Would you, a guy like that? Did you fly this nameless terror free, or did he pay you? Well, he paid me. 500 bucks. I figured he was a live one. Did he pay you in cash? What else? All brand new 20s. a receipt when we book you. Now, what for? I didn't know he was going to bomb the and boat. why didn't you turn him in afterward? Before we started back, Ferrillo contacted his office, and we got some more good news. The bomber had been identified as a known criminal, George Hillman. He had been picked up and was being held at the federal building, awaiting our interrogation. His wallet was also loaded with brand new 20s. $840 worth of crisp new bills. Moss who? What's his last name? Moss. His last name is Moss. His first name is Jonathan. Jonathan Moss. That's right. Never heard of him. He hired you to bomb my boat at Morisco Shoals. Nope. I'm the only one who tells me what to do. Well, you did it on your own then, huh? Sure. What'd I do? Look, what? you paid a man named Bates $500 to take you in his helicopter out to Morisco. 500 bucks? That's right. You got that part of it wrong. All right, then. He took you out to the shoals. Me? I've never been in a helicopter in my life. Never. Till the day before yesterday, huh? I've never been in a helicopter.
was a jerk with a lunchbox. Why? Why is he insisting on cutting his own throat? Hillman, you mean? Yeah. He has just one out and he won't take it. He won't admit he's working for somebody else. Moss. Yeah, maybe. Oh. Kelsey. Yo. I want you to do some more digging on Moss. Mike and I are looking to Hillman's record. Boy, it's your butte. Six arrests, two convictions, four aliases. I'll be able to find something in here. Something that'd stand up in court? No, I got a postponement. But a Coast Guard Marine Board of Investigation has been working on the Arundel case. They're going to let me call witnesses. What for? You can't prove the Nicholson thing on Moss. Can you? Uh, I might. If I can tie him to the bombing. Grant you, I, I don't know how. Yet. I think I do. Yeah? How, Mike? Those $20 bills they found on Bates and Hillman. Brand new, consecutively numbered. They came from Moss, didn't they? Oh, well, we think so. Now, where'd he get them? From a bank. Which bank? Past. There's one every block this part of the country. Yeah. But they all get their brand new money from the Federal Reserve System. Call them, Kelsey. Come on, Mike. We still have a job to do. Checking police files and probation reports produced two new facts on George Hillman. Out of all those aliases, one name turned out to be legitimate. He was really George Morton. And he had a brother, John. When we tried to find out why he called himself Hillman instead of Morton, and what had happened to brother John, he blew his stack. His violence was surprising. Something about the name Morton had touched a sensitive spot. But what it was, or why, we couldn't find out. Kelsey hadn't reported back by the time of the Coast Guard hearing. We had to go before the board with nothing on Moss or Hillman that would tie them together. And Moss proved to be an even tougher witness than Todd Webster had anticipated. Well, Captain Moss? Yes? Yes. You do recognize the man. Objection. This line of questioning is tendentious and irrelevant. The witness obviously does not recognize the man in the photograph. You believe that your questions may throw light on the Arundel casualty and the fate of Captain Nicholson? I do, Captain. Very well. Objection overruled. Exception. Well, Captain Moss, do you know the man in the photo? His name is George Hillman. No, I don't know him. Mm -hmm. The pilot, Robert Lewis Bates, he brought Hillman out to the boat. Do you know him? No, sir. You're certain you're not acquainted with Hillman or Bates? I'm afraid I've never laid eyes on them. Have you ever spoken to them by telephone? Oh, come on now. Have you? No. Mr. Webster, are you implying that Captain Moss was involved in the bombing of Mr. Nelson's boat? Yes, Captain. Well, if you believe that the witness is perjuring himself, you may not imply it. You must present proof. I'm sorry. We will recess for 30 minutes. When we resume, you lose no time in presenting proof. Gentlemen. Maybe you were right, Todd. Maybe we don't have a case. Recess, where have you been? Las Vegas. What? Come on. Well, that's where the Federal Reserve System sent me. Now, those 20s were issued to the Silver State Bank of Las Vegas three days ago. Moss's bank? Sure. And they cashed a check for him that same day for 2,000 bucks. 120s. Here's a photostat of the check, a list of the serial numbers, and an affidavit of the bank teller. 
Oh, and uh, Jonathan Moss isn't his right name. Huh? Well, he changed it several years ago, but not legally. I've got a stat of that, too. Well, where'd you get that? From the bank. I hear it. And his real name was Morton, John Morton. Captain Moss, would you be willing to let the board examine the contents of your billfold? A new bill might be best. Captain, I wish to enter this bill as evidence. Thank you. Now, sir, would you please read the denomination and...